Hello and welcome to Hexed Encountered. In this video, we will be doing a playthrough of the game, The Leaky Luki, Stalingrad of the North. This is from Legion War Games and is designed by Michael Taylor. This is a very simple, well, I shouldn't say simple, it's a very straightforward war game. Uh, small scale, easily transportable, something you can bring on the road with you if you're traveling, vacation, work, whatever it may be. You pack this in into a Ziploc bag. It's very flat and small. The map folds out to 11 by 17. You can see the map here. There's one player aid card. The, the map sheet itself, the playable area is relatively small. This is 11 by 17 and in its entirety, and it does include the turn track, a lost track, Boxes for eliminated units from both the Germans and the Russians. And a combat results table here in the middle. Our player aid card has the terrain key and the terrain effects chart. And then at the bottom you have the colors for the units as well as unit types. How to read the units. Basically it's combat strength on the left and movement allowance on the right. The victory points for every thing that can score victory points within the game. Uh, so you have single objective hexes that would be something like Shubino here with the Soviet star and the German cross. That is a victory hex for both sides. You have some here like Rusinovo, who is just a victory hex for the uh, Soviets. Um, Dem, or is that, that might actually be for Veliki, Luki, so never mind. Nazva here, that's for both. Um, Shubino, I already mentioned. Demya, you can see them here on the map. Those are all worth one point each for both sides. Then you have the two bigger sit, the two bigger towns, because there aren't. This is not a, a like a major metropolitan area. The battle for Vilike Luki took place in the winter of 42-43. The game runs from uh, mid-November or late November of 42 through early February of 43. This is part of Operation Mars, kind of the northern uh, pincer of that particular operation. So it was taking place basically at the same time as the Soviet offensive in the south that was that had encircled Stalingrad and was then reducing and eliminating the 6th Army. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with that. So Velike Luki here in the center is worth 9 victory points to the Germans, 1 to the Soviets. The Soviets' main objective in this particular part of the offensive was Novoskolki here, which is a railroad junction. And though the Soviets did capture this, this objective, they did not manage to capture this one as part of the objective. Now you can see the forces are a little thin on the ground here. The Germans are here. They've got three uh, regiments out here and then some more in, in the town of Veliki Luki and a couple of security, well, a security unit and an engineer unit in Novoskolnki. So they're, they're thin on the ground. It, appa it appears the Soviets are as well, but the Soviets are about to pour in a bunch of reinforcements. They're all lined up down here. You can place them on the map if you wish. Um, I lay them out because this allows me to easily see that on turn three, for example, the Germans will get one replacement point of infantry. Turn four, the Russians will get one replacement fo point for mechanized and so on down through turn seven. All of the forces will be on the map by the end of turn six, and the, and the game runs through turn 10. So um, this is a tough one for the Germans. They are playing defense um, early on, and then they can, the, as their strength builds a little bit, they can do some kind of damage control, counterattacking. Um, but they're, they're going to be in a tough situation. So it's, it really boils down to, and this is a two-player game, that is easily soloable. The rules are about uh, six pages long. Very easy to understand. Very straightforward. You have zones of control. You have stacking limits. You have all the things you would expect to get in a Hex Encounter War game. I'm kind of front-loading this with my thoughts on the game. And then we'll do the playthrough right after. Um, because, you know, some people don't watch the whole video. So if, you're, if, if the bottom line for you is, is this a good game? The answer to that question is yes. The reasons for that will become evident if you watch the playthrough, but I would heartily recommend this. It, it's like $16, $17 on the Legion's web, Legion War Games website, so it's definitely worth worth your, uh, your financial investment, I guess you could say, because it is a good game. So let's, uh, let's talk about the, the setup here. I am using the optional rules, and there are four of those. Uh, there's one for surrendering, which we'll talk about later. Unit cohesion, that's the one I'm going to talk about right now. This is mainly just as far as like setup and arrival of units. 
particularly on the Russian side, but also in a limited manner on the German side as well. So you have here, you see these uh, arrows with this, this you know, num name and number here. So these are your armies or corps. You have the second mechanized core here. You have the fifth guard shock uh, core here and the third shock army down here. You'll note on the counter here, this counter at the right side there says 3SA for the third shock army. So that would indicate what uh, unit that is. And so you kind of limit for your deployment based on the unit. There's also the, uh, there's also another unit that's kind of an independent unit on the Russian side that you can deploy anywhere. And once they're on the map, they can go wherever they want. You don't have to maintain your cohesion throughout the game, but it does determine kind of where you deploy. So in terms of general strategy, what the Soviets did historically was, was basically envelop the, the, the town of Velike Luki by going south and north of the city and, circ and kind of meeting back in the middle because a frontal assault is, is would, was going to be very difficult. This city or town, it's really a town, does have here this, this counter right here, which is a two, level two fortification, which will give you two column shifts to the left as a defender when combat is initiated in that hex. And what, what can happen is the first time you take a step loss in your defense of Velike Luki, if you're playing as the Germans, you would replace that you take the, the step losses applied to the fortification and then it becomes a permanent level one for fortification and any step losses beyond that apply to the units fortification remains in place. So ultimately your goal as the Germans, of course, is to hold on to this as long as possible and then build up some power behind it and kind of try and thwart the Soviets uh, attempt to get around and, and basically isolate it. There are supply rules. You have to be able to trace a line of supply to your friendly map edge. So that would be this side for the Germans, this side for the Russians. And it, you cannot pass your supply trace through an enemy zone of control. So zone of control works just as it does in most war games. You have your unit in a hex. The six hexes around it are within its zone of control. Same thing for, for both sides. Um, one of the optional rules will, let you, will allow you to move from an EZOC to an EZOC if the unit that is projecting that zone of control is a regiment or brigade as opposed to a division. We have one division here and uh, one division here for the Soviets. The, the Germans have nothing but regiments out on the map right now. And I don't know that they actually even have any divisions that will make an appearance. But there will be divisions, plenty of them, on the Russian side. We have a brigade here and a brigade here as well. Uh, as you can tell by your unit key here, we have your your standard loadout of World War II unit types with infantry of of leg, mechanized, uh, mountain, motorized, ski, etc. There are engineers. There's an anti-aircraft unit. There are security units. They are there are tank units. There's an artillery unit, etc., etc. So this is a tank unit, obviously, as part of the. Uh, third shock army. You can tell it's a brigade. It's got the single X, etc., etc. Our victory points here. Uh, Velike Luki is worth nine victory points to the Germans, but only one to the Russians. And Novol Skolniki here, over here, is worth, or Novol Skolniki, I guess, is actually what it is, is worth three to the Germans and two to the Russians. The Russians will gain one victory point for every German unit they eliminate. The Germans gain a victory point for every Russian step they eliminate. So we'll, that's how we'll track that. The Soviets always go first. My game turn marker here is on turn one. We have a victory point tracker for both the Germans and the Russians that we will use as they accumulate victory points as we move through the game. I won't worry. At first, we're, I mean, while you're playing, you count up the losses. So a German unit loss will give the Russians one victory point. A Russian step loss will give the Germans one victory point. At the end, we look at who controls what uh, sing single hex victory points, like Nazva, which is one victory point for either side if they control it. And then, of course, the two bigger ones heat the, uh, being these two. And then we'll determine who wins the game. All right, so the game is very straightforward. The first phase is the replacement phase. Now, that only applies in turns three, four, five, six, and seven. We don't have that yet. 
Second part of the turn is the movement phase. So you have movement, then reinforcements will enter and you can move them and then you will conduct your combat and then we move to the other side. And once the, well, you do the Soviets, those three phases, then you do the Germans, those three phases, and then you move to the next turn and it's the Soviets again. So I'm going to re, I'm going to set up my shot to be tighter on the map and I'll talk about the CRT and I'll show it occasionally so you can see what uh, the results are from die rolls. This game does not come with dice, but I am supplying my own black die for the Germans and my own red Soviet style uh, Axis and Allies die <laughs> for the uh, Soviets. So this, the uh, hammer and sickle here is the one. There is a six right here. So I'm supplying those dice and we will, uh, like I said, I'm going to kind of zoom in a little tighter on here to kind of take advantage of, you know, this being a relatively small contained area, get a nice good look at all the hex, at all the hexes and the counters and everything and make the gameplay pop a little bit instead of this more wide view where everything is a little small. Okay, so hopefully this is a little bit better and you can see things a little bit more clearly in this, uh, in this layout. So I did place out the reinforcements that we'll be entering on this turn. We'll do our on-map movement first, then we will move these uh, arriving units. And they're already assigned to their areas. This is 3rd Shock, this is 5th uh, Guard Shock Core, and the 2nd Motorized Core at the top. Then over here we have a single security regiment that will arrive for the Germans. As I said, they start off kind of slow and they have to build up their forces, but ultimately they will be able to put some power in certain areas and if things go well, they can focus it and do some damage to kind of slow the Soviets down. The Soviets do have a massive stack here for turn two that will be coming up obviously pretty soon. All right, so movement is pretty simple. You do have to uh, movement point costs. If you travel road or railroad, it's one. And then the various terrain will cost more and that will also depend on your unit type. So for wooded, for example, so if this guy went this way, he's an infantry, so he's leg infantry. To move him there would cost two movement points. If you're ski or mountain, it's one and a half in the woods. If you are a motorized unit or a unit that has vehicles, let's say, mechanized, motorized, or a tank, it costs three movement points to move through the forest. So in this case... Now, since they're already in an enemy zone of control, in theory, they can move from one to another because that is only a regiment. This gives the Russians a little bit more flexibility. As far as stacking rules go, you can stack three units in a hex, but no more than one of them can be a division. So you can never stack two divisions in one hex, let alone three. But you can stack a division and two brigades or a division and a brigade and a regiment or a division and two regiments or three regiments, three brigades, some mixture thereof. You get the idea. So basically, we, um, what I typically do, or what I would think I would do in this instance, is we'll set up an attack. Now, if we do want to, we, the trick for the Soviets, in my opinion, is to kind of put some pressure on the center so it looks like it's a frontal assault while trying to flank on both sides to try and get around behind the German garrison here and isolate it, knock it, knock its supply out, and then you can eliminate it. You whittle it down and you eliminate it. So with that in mind, we're going to take our uh, third shock army here. I'm going to move him here, which uh, you're crossing a minor river, which does not add anything as far as movement. Minor river hex side is a free move. And this is an infantry unit moving from this wooded area to this wooded area which is also a village, but again, that does not, village doesn't add anything. You look at the terrain around the village, which in this case is woods. So that costs that unit two movement points, leaving him with four. He's done moving anyway, so it doesn't matter. But um, if we take our tank here, now if he moves here, he's in this zone of control. So he can move here. Now as a tank unit, that move costs him three movement points. And then this would be a three additional movement points. But we're going to do it anyway to get a 10 to 5 advantage here. Now we'll also be able to bring this guy on and just bring him up this road maybe to get a, uh, what would that be, a 19 to 5, which would still be a 3 to 1 advantage, not a 4 to 1 because you don't round up. So that's one move. I'm not going to make a move here and I'm not going to make a move here. So now we would move to our reinforcement phase. So let's just say we're going to bring this guy down the road here. 
And I did not put plexi on this because I wanted to keep it kind of um, glare free, shall we say. Okay, so I did say I was going to take this guy and move him here. And then we have three units here for fifth shot core or fifth guard shot core. So we're going to take him and move him here. Now, again, if he moves, once he moves next to a German unit, he's in that unit zone of control. So his best move, as he's a division, cannot move in here with another division, but he can move here. Now, this is also a division, and we'll move him this way. So now we've got 21 to 4, and we have a brigade of tanks that we can put wherever we want. So we'll just move this guy down and put him here. So we're going to try to crack this open to remove that zone of control and open up the path for the frontal portion of the assault because we want to get in this area while also going around. And as more units arrive on the scene, we'll be in better shape to do that. So now we'll start combat. Combat is really straightforward. Basically, what it involves is you look at the total combat strength of both sides, and then you'll do shifts based on some there's shifts and some diro and, and a single diro modifier based on terrain, typically. So we have uh, 7, 14, 21, 24 to 4. That's a 6 to 1. Our combat uh, chart, the max, is 5 to 1. So on the back of our rule book, you have a really good look at the combat results chart. Nice and large, easy to read. You can see it only goes to 5 to 1. Anything above 5 to 1, we ignore. Anything below a one to three isn't allowed. So you can do, you can attack at one to three, but you can't go below that or the attack is canceled. And you can do, I mean, honest, honestly, if you look at these odds, it's very unlikely you would want to do a one to three unless you're hoping for an exchange, I guess. Um, but five to one is the max you can get there. So we would be looking at a five to one, but that's pre-terrain effects because the wooded terrain... If we look here at our terrain effects chart, wood combat effect, one column shift to the left. Then we have you multiple units. These two are attacking across a minor river. That is the Cunha River. River. Wow. The Cunha River. It's a minor river hexide. It is a minus one diro modifier. So we're going to take one column shift to the right, which makes it four to one. And then we are going to subtract one from our die roll. So I'm going to roll my Soviet die here. And that is a five, and the five becomes a four, and a four in the four to one column is defender, one step loss, and a retreat. Okay, so he has to retreat. Now, you also have to worry about zones of control when you're retreating. So he cannot retreat here because he'd be going Ezoc to Ezoc, and, you can, and if you're forced to do that, you take a step loss. In this case, he's already taken a step loss. And he can afford to take that step loss, although his combat strength will be down to a one. But basically, the only place he can retreat is here. So he's going to retreat to this hex right here. That is a step loss. We flip him over. And that is the end of that combat. Now, these guys can advance if they wish to. So we'll take one of our divisions and push it here. I'm going to leave these here because we're going to probably head to this hex next, I'm thinking, most likely. Okay, now we'll do an attack down here as well. So we have 19 to 5. I already counted that up before. So that is a 3 to 1. He is also in woods. There are no rivers that we're attacking across. So there is no die roll modifier. We're in the 3 to 1 column. We roll our single die. We get another 5. So three to one, five is again a D1R. So we have to retreat one hex. We retreat and we lose a step. Now this guy is a mountain unit. So he's going to, he takes a step loss and retreats here. This hex, because of the lake, you cannot, like if he retreat, he couldn't retreat here because of the zone of control anyway. But if he had, if he, let's say he could, if he, if he did retreat here, he would not be able to move to the to the uh, west he would have to go north or east he couldn't go he couldn't go west or south because of the the lake so this was really his only path of retreat and then again they can advance so we'll move the the uh the guards unit up here and all the units have their designation on them so you can see this is the 21st guards division 
And you see the one there in the corner that denotes the, the that it arrives as a first turn reinforcement. All right, so he's there. Now up north, we have eight to three. We do have a river. So it, it, we could make the attack. It's two to one. We would take a, a column shift. And I just realized I didn't apply the column shift, did I? Because this was uh, three to one. And it should have been a two to one. So actually, I the step loss did not take place. Because we were in three to one where the five was D1R. But it should have been two to one because of the column shift. So I missed that. So there is no step loss, and they just retreat one hex. Now up here, we have eight to three, which reduces to two to one, and we have a river, and we have a wooded defense, wooded hex for the defender. So that is a two to one, gets shifted to one to one with a minus one DRM. If we look at our result chart here, you have some attacker losses at the very top, um, and you need to roll. If we rolled a six, they would take a step loss. If we roll we couldn't roll a seven so that with the minus one, they would never get this retreat. Best we could hope for is roll a six and get a D1. Then we have exchange. Uh, and EX1 is actually a, um, both sides lose one step and a defender retreat here on the key. So there are two potentials there. So let's, let's do it because this is the Soviets we're talking about and they weren't exactly concerned about losses. And we roll a three, which reduces to a two, which is no effect. So no effect. And that would complete the Russian turn. And now we would go over to the German side. So in terms of movement for the Germans, you have to kind of try and determine from, from a strategic standpoint, do you want to try a forward defense in front of the Lovat River here? Or, um, which you probably need to do at least a little bit. Right, because you want to slow them down until your reinforcements start to come in. Uh, it's going to be hard to make a, a make a stand on on the eastern side of this river, though. Ultimately, your your main stand is going to take place behind the river line. It just has to, um, because the Soviets are going to get on top of the Germans in a hurry, and there's just nothing. There's not enough. Uh, you know, the Germans are thin on the ground, so this is going to be a tough situation for them. Now, I personally don't believe in leaving Novosokolniki open. I mean, the, the Russians can't get there, like, next turn or something. But still, it's a little... Uh, I would prefer to keep as much power in here as possible. It's a six right now. This guy comes on, but we do that later. So if I say I'm not going to move anybody, which, I'm, which isn't what I'm going to say, actually. <laughs> what I'm going to say is I'm going to move this mountain troop back one. And I'm going to move this guy back one onto the hill. This is a hill. Hill will give us a column shift. And the wooded will give us a second column shift. So this is a good defensive position. That to me is the key. You have to find good defensive positions for the Germans. There aren't a ton of them, but there are some. Um, the same thing here. Like if he pulls back, and he needs to pull back. But if he pulls back here, he's in open terrain, and that's asking for trouble. But we have a minor river that kind of protects this entire hex, so we're going to do that. Because that's all, the minus one DRM can come in handy, but the wooded uh, column shift comes in a lot handier. And then the same thing up here. If he moves here, he's out of their, out of their zone of control, and then I can, in theory, retreat again across the river if I want to, which I'm going to do anyway. Because now I've set up a place where we have a, a zone of control here and here and here and here. So regardless of whether or not the Soviets will get there and attack us, which they will, but they cannot go past us. So there are no gaps for them to shoot through. You want to maintain as much of a line as possible while building your power. At least that's my take on it tactically. Now this guy will come in and we will move him along the road. So this would be one. Uh, two, three, four, five, and we'll put them here. Ultimately, I'm going to see if I can get this unit to survive to turn three, where, where I can actually give him his step back and get us to uh, get him back to full strength. So that would end turn one. 
And no victory points were earned, actually, because no Germans were eliminated and the Germans did not attack the Russians. So we go to turn two, November 28th through December 6th. We have a whole bunch of reinforcements. So I'm going to pause and put them on map and then we'll pick up and move on through turn two. On to turn two. So as you might notice here at the very top, you've got a whole bunch of stuff coming in for the second uh, mechanized core. And then there's a single unit here from the 5th uh, Guard Shock Corps. We have a unit here, and this is the one I was referring to before. This is the 8th ERC. And there's this is the 1st, uh, or rather, 19th Guards Division. And that one is kind of a freelancer. can go wherever you want. So I was going to add it to the 3rd Shock Army area down here. They get two. Well, they get a division and then a ski, a brigade of ski troops. And so this is my southern echelon. We have our northern echelon up here. And these guys are going to push the middle and hopefully put some pressure on uh, Veliki Luki there in the middle while these guys try to go around and uh, wreak some havoc and hopefully get around behind there and bag some Germans. So with all that in mind, we're going to start our next turn. Now, th this is going to be a little interesting in terms of how do we want to handle this unit, okay? Because we can't, I mean, we can move here, um, but you cannot attack across that hex side. So that's going to be a problem. So if I move him here, I can't say, oh, I'm going to apply this nine to have him attack. No, 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 you can't do it. Or we can go here, and then I could bring a brigade in on top of it. So if I brought the uh, this ski unit here, could he get there? That'd be one, two. Yeah, he could get there. So then that would make it an 11 to 5, which is a 2 to 1. He's in wooded hexes, so it becomes a 1 to 1 attack. So we could do that, and I may do that. So let's just say we're going to move him here, and then I'm going to take my two third shock units here. And move them up one hex to here so that they can attempt to dislodge this guy from the hill. Now, alternately, I could have done this and gone one, two, which leaves that uh, open to bring another division up, like this guy say, bring this division up in here or even this one up in here. We can do that as well. And we may end up doing that. But for now, he's going to be here. That way we avoid the zone of control until we get to that spot. So that was the key component there. Now what I'm going to do here is we're going to move this guy. This stack is going to move here. Now you might say, why not here? Because we can move this one here. And now we've got a bunch of power to attack this unit, which is probably going to result in it being eliminated. Um... But it is what it is. I was hoping to hold on to it, but it's from the German standpoint, but it's probably not going to happen. Now up here, we can move here, and now he's on a road hex, so he can follow the road, and there's no German zone of control until he gets here, maybe. Right? So he could go from from there. That was one. Oh, no, he went from here. So that's actually uh, two. And then he can move here, and that would be five which is fine because he's setting up to attack this guy, but across a major river hex side, that is an additional uh, shift. So that would end up being a two column shift because he's also in the woods, which is why I retreated him to that, that hex. And we'll take this one and go here for uh, two and here for two more. You could also go one, two, it would be the same, same thing. So it doesn't matter. For this guy will go one and then two. So we can now put uh, 16 to 3, which of course is fi um, 5 to 1. It will get reduced to a 3 to 1, but uh, that's still worth, worth doing. Okay, so now we'll do our reinforcements. So as I mentioned, I'm going to take this ski brigade. And we're going to go 1, 2, and ski troops move, I believe it is one, uh, one and a half. So that would be 4 and a half. So he's fine there. This guy will move up the road and go one, two, three, four. Now this one is our freelancer and 
it's a little limited on what he can actually do, but we're gonna we're gonna try and bring him up the up the southern side as well. So we're gonna just gonna go one, two, three, and have him sit there as kind of a reserve for now. Um, like I could move him here, but there's no benefit to doing that. It just eats up movement points because he cannot attack across that lake hex side anyway, so it does not matter. We'll bring this guy and send him. One, two, three, and then this one. These, we're going to start moving these guys. So we've got uh, two, looking for, for motorized here. So we've got some mechanized here. We've got a couple mechanized. Yeah, so we're going to split these up. So we've got two, two, uh, two brigades of, of leg infantry regular rifle rifle brigades we've got a couple of actually have three mechanized brigades and two tank brigades so let's split the tank brigades and we'll send we're, we're going to split these guys up and we're going to try to try and get them on map and in in positions here so we have two here and they can go one, two, five. I really should be using tweezers, but my tweezer skills are not good. Then we'll take our mechanized here and we'll move them through the clear, clear hex here. One, two, five. And then can they jump the river? I don't think they can because it costs one extra movement point so they'll have to stop there and it's not worth it to add them to this combat because it's already five to one so it would be overkill and it's not worth doing and the same thing up here we will send these guys uh send these guys we'll go one uh one two and we're going to put them here, but they may not actually participate in the combat. I mean, they could. It doesn't really matter because their move is done either way. Um, so that would be the end of the movement. Now we'll do combat. So if we come down here, we've got an 11 to 5. It's a 2 to 1. It's woods. So that gives us a one column shift to the left. So it's a 1 to 1. And we're going to attack. And we got a 6, which is the best result you can get. So one to one, a six is defender retreat. So our uh, mountain troops here have to retreat again. And I guess we'll retreat them here for now. And then we'll see, I might, I might use my movement to actually move him into Borky. We're gonna advance both of our units up because again, we're trying to push through in the south as well. Now here we have six and 13, 16 to three. That is a five to one. We do have the hill and the wood, so that's gonna become a three to one. We also have the minus one DRM. So it's a three to one attack with a minus one DRM and we got a one. So a three to one, zero is no effect. So no effect. That's the, the beauty of sticking yourself on that particular hill right there. That is a good defensive position. Now the question becomes, do we want to attack Velike Luki? Probably not, but we can take a look at it. We've got 17 here. They've got 6, 10, 12. So that's a one-to-one -one with a two-column shift to the left for the fortifications, which would make it a one-two-three, which is typically a bad idea um, the best you can hope for is an exchange and we would be attacking across a river so that does not help it makes it impossible to get an exchange at one to three the best you can hope for then is a no effect so they will not attack there which frees this guy up to join in on an attack on this one and we can easily get we've got 10 to 1 right there without these guys even attacking so we'll say uh, five to one, it is across a river, so they do get a minus one, and it becomes a four to one because of the wood. So it's a four to one with a minus one DRM. That is a two, four to one, one 
is EX1. So EX1, both sides lose a step, defender retreats one hex. In this case, the defender's already reduced, so he's eliminated. That gives the Soviets one victory point. And they can advance now. So they are allowed to move up, and we will do so. Now we have one more attack to do. This is an 8, 10, 12, 19 to 3. So we are looking at 5 to 1. And we are looking across a major river, which is a second column shift. So second column shift means it's going to be a 3 to 1. There is no die roll modifier, however, because we get a minus one for the river and a minus one for the woods. We rolled a one, a three to one, zero is a one rather is a D1. So D1 is a one step loss. So we'll flip this up and he's a one step unit. So he is just eliminated. They get a second victory point and that ends their turn. We will move uh what do we have let's jump this unit we'll jump that stack and maybe we'll jump we'll jump one of these brigades too put three units on that side of the river why not okay so now we go over to the german side so again now the germans have a pretty big wide open gap sitting up there in the north and that's a problem so let's see what we can do about that problem. We have the 8th Panzer here. So these units have to kind of stay together, at least initially. So we have three units for the 8th Panzer. Right, They're all regiments, of course. You've got the 10th Panzer Regiment and a couple of mechanized. The 28th Panzer Grenadier and the 8th Panzer Grenadier. So these three units are about the best the Germans have. They're not quite the best, but they are amongst the best the Germans have right now. So we're going to move, uh, we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, we'll leave one here. No, we'll leave one here. That would be seven. And we'll put, we'll do like that, I guess. So now again, we're setting up a secondary kind of uh, defense line here. Now we have some motorized infantry down here, so they're going to hop in their trucks here. They're Opal Blitzes, and they will be used to shore up, I think, probably this area, maybe. Or do I want to send them up here, too? We need to blunt the Soviets at some, some spot, and they have, a lot of they have a lot of power up here. They also have a good amount of power down here, but... Some of it is going to get sucked into the sink around uh, Belike Luki. So I'm going to take these two motorized. I'm going to go one, two, three. Actually, we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then these guys are going to head this way, I think. So they'll go one. Two, three, four, five. Leave that unit there. Or no, we'll put them here. Six. So they'll stack here because that six is as far as we can move. Oh, I didn't move this guy, but I wanted to. So I'm just going to do it now. We're going to retreat him to Borky across the river. We'll leave this guy here on his hill. That's a good defensive position. And that is the end of turn two. We go to turn three. The Germans will get uh, some reinforcements and a single replacement point, which right now does them no good because they don't have a reduced unit at the moment, but that can easily change this turn. So we will wait and see what occurs there. And I'm going to pause again here and we will, so I can stack out my, actually, it's not even worth it. This is the eighth ERC. We'll just put them probably down here. The Germans get a Luftwaffe unit and a Panzer, um, or SS motorized unit, rather. So we'll just sit, set these guys in their reinforcement area and move right into turn number three, the Soviet turn. So I think what we'll do is we will move these guys up here. That's, a, that's only a one 
point move, but they are now in an ESOC, so they do have to stop. Now, this is where um, they could actually use that rule of moving from ESOC to ESOC. So the ESOC to ESOC movement, it says a friendly unit may move from ESOC to ESOC if the enemy occupied hex or hex is exerting the zone of control over the friendly unit contains a single enemy regiment or brigade. So that would be this guy exerting, a, a, exerting here. So this could move there. This is determined before movement. The move is not allowed if the enemy hex contains a division or a stack. This expends the unit's entire move allowance. It's going to move here. That's just to prevent you from doing it multiple times, I think, because, oh, I'm going to go here and then here, and now I've got them surrounded kind of thing, which would then allow us to move him up because, again, you can't stack divisions, and the Soviets are definitely going to try and crack this hill. Now, we could also do it, uh, well, but we could, I don't think we could. We can't do it here because that's a stack. Now, technically, the stack and Velike Luki, because they're in fortifications, do not exert a zone of control. But we have a stack here as well, which also exert a zone of control into that hex. I believe I need to, I'm going to confirm that about the, does the Lovat uh, affect the zone of control? I don't think it does. Yeah, it doesn't say that it does, at least not that I see. So I think we're good there. Now, as far as what we should do here about, um, about this, I think because of the fact that it, it doesn't exert a zone of control, this unit could move like there if it wanted to. But again, I'm not sure I want to even attack them there. I'm probably going to just take this guy and have him move up and, and sit here. Then we'll have a couple divisions sitting right, right there facing Velike Luki right on the doorstep. And here we have, what, a division and a brigade. So we can move another brigade in there if we wanted to. So we'll do that. And then we'll take these. And they can go one. And then across the river into a clear hex would be two more. And this is a, Z a Zoc, so they have to stop. And then we can move this one here. And that is a division, so they cannot move there, but he can move. Well, we'll just jump them. So they move there for one. It'd be plus one and plus uh, two, so that's four total. So they're good as well. And these guys will move up here. And then this one jumps, that costs them. Three plus one is four, plus three more is seven. All right, now this guy is going to, as I said, well, he was gonna go up there in the middle and I moved those other guys in there. So maybe we'll try and send him around. This is the problem, they have too many divisions. Let's take them south. One, two, uh, four, six, so he'll stop here. Okay, now we have combat to figure out. So we do have 9, 11 to 5 here across the river. It's going to be a two-column shift. That would make it a uh, 1 to 2. So they will not be doing that until this unit can move up next turn and get here. It is something of a race against time as well from the Soviet standpoint. Um, the longer the Germans can hold on, obviously, the better their score will be. Now up here, we've got 6, 14, 17, 24 to 3. Again, that's going to reduce down to a 5 to 1. We do get the 2 column shift, and we do get the minus 1 DRM. So it's a 3 to 1 with a minus 1 DRM. They get a 4. And a 4 on a 3 to 1 is a DR, and so is a 3 after we adjust, um, after we roll, adjust it down. So they do knock them off the, uh, they do knock them off there. Now we do have a situation, right? Because their only retreat path that does not enter another Zoc is here. Because if they go here, they get a Zoc from these guys. They go here, they get a Zoc from these guys. 
So in this case, there is a rule that allows you to retreat further than one hex due to overstacking. So that's what we will do. We'll retreat here to avoid an enemy zone of control. And then we will continue that to land here in Plato Novo and stop there. So that's uh, those two combats are done. Because everything over here we already moved. Uh, we already moved. So I don't think anything else is going to happen in the north. So that would end the uh, Soviets turn three and we flipped that over and I finally remembered to do it. And I know you can't see the turn, the turn track, but we are on turn three, December 7th to 15th. And the Germans get a infantry replacement this turn, but they do not have a reduced unit on which to use it. So it's not going to be used. So we go to the movement phase for the Germans, and now we can see if there's a maybe an attack we can do. So we could move this one three. Actually, that's only two, and then uh, but that's in the zone of control. But he could go one, two. If he wanted to stack, he could go one, two, and then stack here. So let's do that. One, two, and then two more is four. Now we have an eight here. And then uh, let's see. We probably can attack these guys if we want to. They've got that's only a six, that'd only be a nine to an eleven. That's not great. <laughs> In fact, that's the opposite of great. But we do have six and ten is sixteen. We have a twenty to nine there. We would take a, a column shift, so that would make it a one-to-one -one with a minus one DRM. I don't think we're going to do that. I think for now the Germans will continue to play it safe and marshal their forces and try to punch. Well, I have to move my reinforcements, actually, so let me do that. Because if I move my SS unit, one, two, three, four, five, six... Or I could put them here. Let's put them here on the hill. And let's put the Luftwaffe unit one, two, three, four, five. Put them there. Okay, and I don't think we will attack anybody. Because that would be 6, 12, 15 to 11 is still 1 to 1. We would take a minus 1. DRM, if we look at our 1 to 1, we'd have to roll a, we'd have to, we'd have to roll a 6 to get a, a D1. Not worth it, so we'll move to turn 4. Again, I know you can't see the turn track, but we're moving to turn four. And they are, the, the Germans have no reinforcements this turn. The Soviets do have a few. We have a third shock. We have a fifth. We have an eighth. And we have another eighth. So nothing in the north. Okay, so let's move him up. And we'll move... Uh, we'll move him up, and we'll move him up, and we'll move these guys up. And then in the north, we can move these guys here. And then we'll bring our reinforcements on. One, two, uh, three. One, two three and we'll send these guys along the southern route here they're both brigades so one two five seven and then it would be two five eight i think because it's three for the tank. So it would be one, two, five, eight. And then for two for the infantry would be one, two, four, six. So he could actually move here. So we'll do that and lead the tank back for now. 
Okay, so now let's do some attacking and we'll start uh, south to north. So we'll start down here where we have a two and a seven is nine, 11, 20 to eight. So that is two to one with a two column shift, which would be a one to two. So they probably will not do that. Although there is no die roll modifier. So if you did roll a, uh, a, ret uh, a six, you would get a retreat. But I mean, I know the Russians had a reputation for not really caring all that much about the safety of their units, but that seems like a bad bet. Like even here, 14, 17, 24 to 9 is still only 2 to 1. And you would get a one column shift because they are not in the woods. So that's a 1 to 1. So let's do that one. They do get a minus 1 DRM for the minor river though too. And they rolled a six, so that's a pretty good roll. Now we're two to one. Well, five is defender retreat, so it actually works. So they have to retreat. They will retreat. Ooh, this is like not, not a great area to be having to retreat, but they'll retreat here. We'll hop the river with this unit and the tank unit. This unit has been used. We still have not attacked Velike and Luki yet, and I'm not sure. Well, we could. We know that the three was used um, already, right? No, it wasn't. So we have 10, 12, 16, uh, 21, 24, 31 to 12, 2 to 1, 2 column shift. It's going to be. One to two. Uh, and we are we're also attacking across a river. So we can't do it. I mean, we can do it, but it's a bad idea. The best we could hope for is roll a six and get an exchange. Because if we can force a step loss in Velike Luki, we would knock their fortification level down from a two to a one. And that's a, that's a whole column shift. So let's try it. This is good. This is risky because one to two is not great odds and it's a three. So this did not pay off. So it's a three, which becomes a two and that's an attacker one. So that's going to be a step loss on the Soviet side. So we'll take it with this unit right here. That is a victory point for the Germans. Now I only did that because again, it's a gamble to try and get that fortification reduced to a one. So that was the point of doing that particular attack. Okay, so now here we have 11 to 3 or 11 to 6. Obviously, we would take 11 to 3, which is a 3 to 1 with a minus 1 DRM. It's a 4. So 3 to 1, 4 becomes a, two, a 3, which is still defender retreat. So they will retreat, and I'm going to retreat them uh, here. And now we will, uh, we're going to jump the river with two of the three units. We'll leave the division where it is. And now we're starting to get into a situation, which I haven't really talked about it, but you're supposed to check supply for every combat. Now, now we're in a situation where they, they are tracing supply along this rail line, basically. But this is in, a, in, a, in an EZOC now. Because this unit, this unit, these units, and these units all exert zone of control into this hex. But, so does this stack of German units. So that means it can pass through. So for now, they're still supplied. But if they can close this hole, and they can't, unless this only has one regiment in it, and... Um, so far it doesn't, or if I move something up here, that would also kind of uh, take care of that. So that is that, uh, wait a minute. These guys were here, right? I messed that up because they didn't attack. It was this one that attacked. So we're just gonna move one of the, uh, do we wanna move, move one of the, we're not gonna move one unit because we still have a zone of control into here. Um, 
So we're not going to advance into that hex because if I do that, then it opens up a weak spot for one of these two units. I'm not going to split my strength right now um, because we're going to try to attack this stack, I think. So we've got four. Uh, we've got 10 there. There's 14 German in this, in this uh, hex. So 10, 12, 14, 20. So that's two to one. 29 to, what did I say was here? 14. So it's two to one with a sink. So it's going to be a one to one. And there is no die roll modifier. So let's take a crack at it. It's a one. So a one to one on a one is an attacker one. So they do take a step loss. Um, that's a single unit. I don't know that I want to do that. So we'll take it on this one infantry division. And that gives the Germans a second victory point. And now we go over to the German side here. And let's see what we'll do. Uh, they have no reinforcements this turn. I'm not sure I really want to do much. I'm looking at opportunities here. We've got, what, nine... And six is 15 to 11. So it's one to one with a minus one DRM. Again, that's not a great thing to do. Here we have our fives. We've got 14, 18, 20 to five. 20 to five, four to one. We will take a minus one DRM, but let's, let's make the attack. It's a three, so it becomes a three to one because of the forest, and we take a minus one there, and that is an exchange one. So in EX1, both sides lose a step, and the defender retreats one hex. So either unit is going to get eliminated, so we're going to eliminate that guy. That gives the Germans another victory point. The Germans have to take a step loss. We do get... Mech, uh, another infantry step next turn. Is any are any of these infantry though? Does infantry count as motorized for reinforcement? No, they don't. Well, crap. Um, so I'll never be able to recoup this. That becomes a one. That becomes a two. So we'll take it here. They have to retreat. So they'll go here to stay on this side of the river and be in a forest. I am not going to advance. And that will end uh, game turn four. I'm going to wrap the video here. Uh, in part two, we'll try to do turns five through ten to wrap up the scenario. But we're approaching an hour in length. I don't typically... Why is my autofocus not working today? Um, I don't typically try to do too much. Sorry, that got a little out of frame there. But uh, yeah, that is going to do it for now. Uh, we'll pick this up with turn five in part two in a couple days or so. You can see the situation here. Uh, things hang very much in the balance. I would say on, ba on, on balance, it would be hard to say who's ahead. Obviously, it's two to one in terms of, or three to two rather, in terms of victory points. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I guess it is. I guess it is. Because the, the Germans get a point for each uh, step loss, and the, the Russians only get a point for a unit eliminated. So the Germans have, yeah, the Russians have two, the Germans have three. And then we'll figure out the, the town ownership at the end. So as always, thanks for watching. I do appreciate it. Please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, etc., etc. That is also very much appreciated. But uh, that will do it. I hope you did enjoy it and we'll come back and check out some future offerings, even if you decide not to like, share or subscribe. Um, but yeah, that's it for this one. So check out part two. Look for that coming out, as I said, within a couple days. But uh, yeah, we're done. My name's Joe. This is Hexed Encountered. And until next time, as always, happy gaming.